Well, thank you, Guy, for the generous introduction. It's an honor as well as a pleasure to have been invited to speak at this public presentation of Professor Beiner's magisterial study. His book is actually a rather difficult act to follow, not only because of his meticulous and original research on the memories of the rebellion of 98 in Ireland, a subject on which I'm not qualified to pronounce, but also because he skillfully placed his empirical findings in the framework of general studies, not only of remembering, but also of forgetting, disremembering, as he calls it. So he doesn't leave very much for me to say. As he suggests, histories of memory should also be concerned with forgetting. And, and Yosef Yerushalm has done this, Paul Ricoeur has done this, and some other historians. Going a little further, I'd like to suggest that to understand most historical phenomena, it can be illuminating to look at the opposite. Histories of knowledge should certainly talk about ignorance, and histories of speech should find a place for silence. The French polymath Michel de Certeau, who wrote a, an extremely perceptive book about historical thought and writing, advised historians always to tell the public where they're speaking from. So I, I'm speaking from the position of a socio-cultural historian and particularly interested in collective memory, whether we call it social memory or cultural memory. Actually, these two phrases are not quite synonyms. They've come out of two different traditions, one French and the other German. French historians are generally at ease with the concept of social memory. In Britain, I have to confess, this, the phrase still evokes a certain degree of suspicion, or at least it did. I remember quite a long time ago, 1980s, I was asked to speak at a conference of social anthropologists. And in my paper at the conference, I used this phrase, social memory. I was immediately taken on one side by a senior anthropologist and told very firmly um, not to use that phrase again. Methodological individualism still rules in Britain, or at least it still ruled in the 1980s. Uh, that was the decade, after all, that Mrs. Thatcher once announced there is no such thing as society. So let me explain, um, maybe unnecessarily in this place, that by using the term social memory, we don't mean to refer to any collective entity, but rather, following the lead of the French sociologist Maurice Albwax, we're concerned with what we might call the clues or the cues that are given to individuals by their memory communities. They may be families, schools, churches, nations. But these groups suggest to individuals, or sometimes put pressure on individuals, not only to remember certain things rather than others, but to remember them in a particular way rather than another. As for cultural memory, that's the German tradition, and I'll be using the phrase to refer, like Abi Warburg, the father of the Warburg Institute, and his more recent successors, Aleda and Jan Assmann, who dominate memory studies in Germany, using the phrase to refer to a kind of archive, or if you prefer, a treasury arsenal of symbols, of images and of stereotypes from which members of a given culture retrieve items when they need them 
not very clear whether this process is, all, is conscious or unconscious or a mixture of the two. But they retrieve them and then they reactivate these symbols and images in a new context. In this way, people construct for themselves, we all construct for ourselves, what's been called a prosthetic memory. That is, a memory that's not originally ours, but it becomes part of us, like an artificial limb, or if you prefer, a walking stick, or indeed a pen, extensions of the body. And now as for uh, what's variously called structural amnesia or social amnesia. Milan Kundra wrote about organized forgetting, thinking in particular of communist Czechoslovakia. Guy Beiner prefers social forgetting or disremembering. The African scholar Sinfri Makoni, who's worked on South Africa, chooses unremembering. The Irish historian Ian McBride opts for decommemoration, and especially explosive decommemoration, as in the case of Nelson's pillar in Dublin, blown up by the IRA in 1966. <clears throat> this is an enormous subject to discuss in a few minutes. Much too big, so I need a focus. And the reflections that follow may be described as variations on a theme by Paul Ricoeur. Ricoeur wrote this big book on history, memory, and forgetting. And the first sentence in the preface is the following. <clears throat> I continue to be troubled by the unsettling spectacle offered by an excess of memory here and an excess of forgetting elsewhere. So my theme tonight is excess. I'll be pursuing the theme with a few concrete examples, collective rather than individual. As you may well imagine, the theme does not exactly lend itself to precise empirical investigation unless someone here can think of a good research strategy of that kind. But I hope it's at least possible to offer concrete examples supporting one hypothesis rather than another. And so, in the first place, who remembers too much? Which examples come most readily to mind? To all your minds. In my own case, I must admit that the first example that occurred to me was that of Ireland. And of course, that made me think of the old epigram, the English never remember, the Irish never forget. That epigram has become a cliché, but as in the case of some other cliché, not all, I do believe that an insight is embodied in it. When I first visited Ireland, it was a, as a child, 1947, and my father immediately warned me on no account to speak one word, one particular word aloud in public, 1916. Actually, this wasn't difficult for me because I didn't know anything about the Easter Rising. But in any case, I discovered a few days later when we went to Drogheda that painful Irish memories go back a lot further than that. Discovered that Oliver Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell presented in British English schools as a hero, is remembered there and elsewhere as a murderer. In, because in 1649, when his army captured the town, civilians as well as royalist soldiers were put to the sword. Second example that occurs to me, maybe also for personal reasons, is Poland. In 1980, when the great Polish writer Czesław Miłosz received the Nobel Prize, most of his speech was concerned with memory. 
It's a theme that also echoes through his poems and through his novels. He criticized what he called the refusal to remember. And he referred, among other things, to the killing of 22,000 Polish officers by the Russians in the forest of Katynia in 1940. The context of this is living outside Poland, he could say it, but in communist Poland in 1980, the Poland from which Miłosz was exiled, that killing was unmentionable in public, or more exactly, it could only be mentioned as an event of the following year, 1941, because the official government line was that the Germans had committed these murders and not the Russians. The great director, um, Andrzej Wajda, as you may well know, made a film on the subject. And it's interesting because most of the film is not concerned with the massacre itself, though the first few minutes are. But most of the film is concerned with the memory of Gatin, that is, with the two rival memories coexisting, coexisting in Poland after the Second World War. Official memory, a deed done by the Nazis, and unofficial memory, it was really the um, Russian secret police that um, shot all these officers. Third example of excess may be the most obvious one, the American South, at least as far as memories of its civil war are concerned. These memories are embodied in many monuments to General Robert Lee and also to middle names of southern boys like Tommy Lee Jones. I think naming uh, children is particularly interesting if we want historical evidence about popular memory. Commemorations generally are top-down events organized officially. Statues are often um, put up by governments or municipalities. But the choice of parents how to name their children, you think that will give valuable clues into what ordinary people thought about particular events or people at a particular time. I realized this uh, very dramatically on a visit to China when my wife and I were in Nanjing and a Chinese student was taking us around the city. So of course we asked her her name and then we asked her whether the name meant something in English and she said memory and so of course we asked the third question so why did your parents call you memory or remember because in Mandarin Chinese it's the same word and she said simply I was born on the day that they arrested the gang of four so a particular reaction to a particular event takes the form of a child's name and is remembered in this way for a lifetime. <clears throat> and during the centennial of the American Civil War, 1961 to 65, there were commemorations every year, but much more important in the South than they were in the North. So one Southerner remarked at this time with the saving grace of humor, I quote, we may have lost the war, but we're sure as hell going to win the centennial. So now the obvious question for a historian to ask, why this excess in particular places? I certainly don't believe in unchanging national character or regional character for that matter. But I do believe that collective concern with the past and with particular events in that past is particularly intense in certain places and certain periods, but from particular moments to whole centuries. So then the question why that should be. So going back to that 
epigram about the English and the Irish, I think it can be generalized. The winners never remember and the losers never forget. The losers, whether what they lost is a battle, a war, their home, their whole country, they suffer from what Freud called repetition compulsion. They've undergone a traumatic experience that they're unable to forget. We might speak of collective trauma, again, not in the sense of a superhuman entity, but as a way of describing the fact that so many individuals, so many families, are suffering the same experience at the same time. In that sense, whole communities, like hysterics, according to Freud, may suffer from reminiscences. Miwash, who had had that kind of experience himself, went so far as to suggest there is no other memory than the memory of wounds. <coughs> Losers, both individual and collective, are, I think, condemned to replay or reenact events in their own minds, searching for what went wrong, imagining again and again how the outcome might have been a different one. The most eloquent and the most moving description of this repetition compulsion known to me comes from the pen, more likely from the typewriter, of William Faulkner, a southerner from Oxford, Mississippi, really deep south. It's a very well-known description, but I simply can't resist quoting it to you once again. So in his novel, Intruder in the Dust, Faulkner wrote about collective memories of the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, a defeat that sealed the defeat of the South in the whole war, and a defeat that followed a cavalry charge led by Colonel Pickett, where the, the charging cavalry were blown away by the artillery of the Union. <clears throat> now I quote, For every southern boy 14 years old, not once, but whenever he wants it, there's the instant when it's still not yet two o'clock on that July afternoon in 1863. The brigades are in position behind the rail fence. The guns are laid and ready in the woods. And the furled flags are already loosened to break out. And Pickett himself with his long oiled ringlets and his hat in one hand, probably, and his sword in the other, looking up the hill waiting for Longstreet to give the word. And it's all in the balance. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't even begun yet. It not only hasn't begun yet, but there's still time for it not to begin. Against that position, in those circumstances. Yet it's going to begin. We all know that. We've come too far, with too much at stake. And that moment doesn't need even a 14-year-old boy to think, this time, maybe this time, with all this much to lose and all this much to gain. Well, <clears throat> it's often said that history is written by the victors, and it, that's true in a sense. Accounts of the past that are taught in schools, or in some cases, the only accounts that are permitted to be published, they usually correspond to the wishes of the people in power. However, following a defeat, searching for, went wrong, for what went wrong is a great stimulus to historians. As a leading German historian, the late Reinhard Koselleck suggested in an in insightful article. <coughs> As a historian of early modern Europe, most of the time, I naturally think of Francesco Guicciardini and the on writing about and because of the tragic invasion of Italy in 1494. 
I think of Paolo Sarpi writing about the Council of Trent as a disappointment, a betrayal of the idealists who hoped for the reform of the church that would lead to the reunion of Christendom. Uh, in Eng England, I think of Lord Clarendon's history of what he called the Great Rebellion, otherwise known as the English Civil War. And of course, I also remember uh, Yosef Yerushalmi's ar argument that history didn't play a major part in Jewish cultural traditions in the Middle Ages, not till 1492. And that, as he says, the primary stimulus to the rise of Jewish histories in the 16th century was the great catastrophe. All those histories were inspired, they were powered by memories of loss. They all shaped memories in their turn. Well, I haven't forgotten that I'm speaking about forgetting. Collective forgetting takes different forms, more or less aware. And I do think that certain cultures in certain periods may be described as having a memory deficit or an excess of forgetfulness. Back to the uh, phrase, the English never remember. England, though definitely not Britain, not talking about Scotland, not talking about Wales, England seems to me to be a classic case. You may find this statement strange given the omnipresence of the past in an old country. But I think in the case of the English, a diffuse sense of continuity replaces most collective memories of specific events. People are proud of their past. They're proud of the way in which the country has changed gradually, peacefully, and often without even admitting it. Even the loss of empire took place without trauma, unlike Spain in 1898. Perhaps because the loss was gradual and it was generally peaceful, at least for inhabitants of Britain. Well, contrasts between France and England are also cliches. But once again, I think a binary opposition embodies an insight. The French have a favorite myth. It's the myth of revolution. The English have a favorite myth. It's the myth of continuity. In many countries, maybe here not being able to read um, Hebrew al alphabet, I can't easily check on this. But in many countries, major streets in major cities are named after key dates in the history of that country, or sometimes region, or sometimes city. I had a dramatic experience of that as a tourist in Bulgaria in the 1960s. At that time, there were no guidebooks available in Britain in the shops because people didn't go to Bulgaria. I managed to find a 1938 edition of the Guide Bleu. I borrowed it from the library, took it with me, and the most valuable thing, there was a street map of Sofia. And I looked at it and Slightly to my surprise, <clears throat> I saw three or four major streets had the name of dates. I had no idea what dates. I didn't know any Bulgarian history, don't know much now as it happens. <clears throat> anyway, got there, used the map to navigate, got lost sometimes. Problem in those days, you couldn't stop people at random and expect them to speak English. I would choose um, mid middle-aged males that looked um, well-educated or were well-dressed and try French. And I would ask for this street, maybe the 3rd of July or whatever, and they would smile and they would direct me and I would arrive and the street was still named after a date, but it was a totally different date. And at that point, after two such 
incidents, it sank in. I'd been asking for fascist dates, and of course, a communist country had communist dates, so that retrospectively, what was interesting was the total absence of surprise when I asked for the wrong thing. But now I come to the point, in Britain, this could never happen. <clears throat> a lifetime living in Britain, I have never seen a street named after any date. Why, why, why is this? I think the myth of continuity. Independence days are celebrated in many countries. Think of the 4th of July in the United States. In Northern Ireland, of course, the 12th of July still resonates, resonates to the beat of those Lambeg drums. Even though the Battle of the Boyne was actually fought on the 1st of July, old style. Remember 1690 is actually painted on walls in Northern Ireland, or at least it was when I first visited Belfast in 1969. And I must say that despite being a historian, I had a sudden urge to get up in the middle of the night, find uh, um, some white paint and paint underneath, please forget 1690. But in contrast, <clears throat> going back to England. Almost all we remember is the 5th of November. And apart from one English town, Lewis in Sussex, we have abandoned its commemoration to the children. As, as late as the 1980s, the children still came out with um, this uh, dummy figure called the guy. And they would stop passers-by and say, penny for the guy, which was the traditional phrase, though they expected, I'm sure, 50p at least. And I would ask them, who is this guy? And if they could tell me about Guy Fawkes, I would give them the money, and if not, not. Since the 1980s, they don't even come out with the guy anymore. Um, the 5th of November is just fireworks. So once again, a non-memorable date, except for celebration, not for historical memory at all. I only can think of one serious exception to this rule, and it's a revealing one. 11th of November, Remembrance Day. And surely the reason for this exception is the fact that although Britain was one of the victors in the First World War, it was at this terrible price. The huge number of dead did lead to a trauma on the national scale, and a, a trauma, therefore, the need for mourning, therefore, the need for Remembrance Day. But, of course, there's an opposite reaction to traumatic events, a reaction shared by victims, perpetrators, bystanders alike the attempt to forget, or, as Guy puts it, to disremember. The, the German writer W. G. Sebald, a man who was, like Miwash, obsessed with memory, wrote that some memories are simply intolerable. We might also speak, once again, like Freud, of the censorship or repression of memories, extending to social groups what he said about individuals. And another useful concept is surely denial, once again in the psychoanalytical sense of the term, a refusal even to mention uncomfortable memories in the forlorn hope that they will simply go away. Hence the need to discuss social amnesia and the different kinds of collective silence. Silence of the guilty, silence of the losers, and so on. Public silences, but also private silences. A vivid metaphor for this situation <coughs> is that of burying the past. The Austro-American writer Walter Abish 
published a novel called How German Is It? Wie Deutsch ist das? The story is about a small German town a few years after the end of the Second World War. In the course of digging the foundations for a new supermarket, had to be a supermarket, a mass grave from a former death camp is revealed. Of course, a camp about which so many people in the town simply do not want to know anything at all. So, Abish uses burial as a metaphor for denial, and the exhumation of corpses makes a powerful symbol for the exhumation of the past, a kind of return of the repressed. Life imitates art, and in Spain today, the literal um, exhumation of corpses from mass graves of the Civil War is again a symbol for attempts to um, unbury that past and for some people fight the Civil War all over again. <clears throat> Hence the need or the duty to forget. Not long ago, the American journalist David Reif published a book entitled In Praise of Forgetting, criticizing the excess of memory in what I can only describe as an excessive manner, or better, a one-sided manner. Of course he has a point, but he refuses to take account of the main argument on the other side, for what Primo Levi called the duty to remember. I think Old Testament phrase, but used by Levi in a quite new context. This argument for remembering may be easily summed up in just two words, never again, or <clears throat> nunca mas, and I'm using a Spanish phrase because it's come into use in the context of the debate about the Spanish Civil War and the mass killings. And it's been still more recently come into use about the other mass killings by the military regimes in Argentina and Chile. Now I believe that the peaceful transition to democracy in Spain after the death of Franco owed a great deal to memories of the Civil War. <clears throat> At that time there were still plenty of people alive in Spain who could remember the war and were therefore absolutely determined to do absolutely anything to stop anything like that happening again. Today though um, you have to be well into your 80s um, to have personal memories of the Spanish Civil War and I believe that that helps explain the willingness of some people to um, unbury the past, reopen old wounds, re reenact the Civil War, the most extreme. And again, in Brazil today, the election as president of a man who parades his nostalgia for the military regime of 1964 and even the tortures committed by some of the uh, army at that time, I don't think that election would have been possible if the history of that regime and its atrocities in parallel with the ones in Chile and Argentina had been a subject for history lessons in Brazilian schools. In fact, that for, it's like forgetting its avoidance. Um, they kept well off the topic. <coughs> well, is there a via media between that excess of remembering and the excess of forgetting? Is some kind of reconciliation possible? I don't really believe in the reconciliation of memories. I don't believe in the reconciliation of rival histories, but maybe in the reconciliation of groups who've been in conflict, Catholics and Protestants, blacks and whites. And of course, there have been some important attempts of this kind. Think of 
the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. <coughs> but I mention a less famous case, a striking example of this strategy at a symbolic level, the case of one monument erected in Delhi. In 1857, a major revolt against British rule in India took place. It's still known by the British as the Indian Mutiny because it began in the army. The Indians view it from another perspective as the first war of independence. Following the suppression of the revolt, a monument was erected in Delhi called the Mutiny Memorial. It was inscribed to the memory of the British soldiers who died in the course of the war and also, I quote, their loyal Indian allies. After India became independent in 1947, one might have expected an act of explosive decommemoration to occur. But the memorial is still to be seen in Delhi. All the Indian government did, after a pause of a few years, was to add a new inscription to include the fighters on the other side. A quote, in memory of the heroism of those immortal martyrs for Indian freedom. Among many examples of attempted reconciliation, I find this one especially memorable. If we can't reconcile memories or histories, a more modest and a more realistic ideal might be to juxtapose them. For a long time, there were no histories of the Spanish Civil War. One of the first overviews came from an Englishman, Hugh Thomas, a, a, a liberal or a liberal conservative believed, who believed in the traditional virtue of historical impartiality and he took an Olympian view of the conflict. Of course, impartiality has its virtues, but I thought that uh, what weakened the book was this Olympian view because it made it very hard to imagine, to feel how could Spaniards become um, so concerned as to be killing one another in such large numbers for their rival ideals. I think a more effective historical strategy is to juxtapose first-hand accounts of the experience and belief of the phalanche on one side and of the communists or anarchists on the other. In other words, I believe that history, since history cannot really be written impartially, the best thing to do is to present multiple perspectives, the d many different points of view, so as to allow the understanding of different points of view, not only in the past, but in the present as well. Different points of view that are based on different experiences, and in that sense they can't be reconciled. So, to return in conclusion to the dangerous, but I think illuminating metaphor of collective psychoanalysis, I end by suggesting that attempts of this kind might, just might, achieve a kind of catharsis. Thank you. Thank you.